So my name is Chris Sikora. I am a high school art teacher. I also am a co-creator of Art Connected. So check out um, artconnected.org for more about that organization and ways you can get involved. If you're a teacher, if you're a student, there's tons of programs and opportunities for everyone involved in art education, period. Um, my website is at chrisacora.com and follow me at Hey Teachers Pod on Instagram to keep up on a lot of the things that I do talk about. I show student work, I show my projects, I show my own work, my own ideas, uh, and work in understanding creativity and whatnot. Um, where I want to begin this talk is with what I like to call the COVID mirror. This, in my opinion, is a time for reflection. I'm sure you need some positivity in your lives, especially related to remote learning, and hopefully I can give that to you in this presentation. But first, let me also acknowledge the, uh, my own privilege to stand before you today and even speak about a thriving learning, uh, remote learning approach. I'm very lucky to have afforded and gained from my experiences to have taught summer school a few months ago and experimented, investigated, surveyed students, reflected, failed, tried again, et cetera, all of which ended up teaching me about the power of asynchronous learning. Don't mistake my optimism uh, for a lack of humility and empathy for the great loss and hardships so many people are facing, teachers, students, uh, as our schools flip back and forth between hybrid, remote, in-person, and back again, uh, our the state of our nation and the division, a plague that has been consuming us long before the pandemic even, the real struggles our parents are dealing with, uh, that they're being forced into these impossible situations in which the blame too often ends up falling on teachers and on how our students and our children are navigating a socially dysfunctional society. Sometimes I think we just need to take a big deep breath because all of that is real, but I wanna offer some opportunities for some positive solutions today, some positive psychology and calm. I have truly found a great deal of rewards in the asynchronous approach to learning, rewards I hope to continue utilizing even after we go back to full in-person learning. And I look forward to answering some of your questions after the presentation and offer some further opportunities for reflection. So the COVID mirror has offered an opportunity for reflection, as I mentioned, in a way that I have not experienced in my 40 years on the planet. Reflection is a key step in the creative process. Many other aspects of adaptation and growth um, are also a part of the creative process. Socially and educationally, we've needed some intense reflection and reform for hundreds of years. This time is hard, but it can also be really exciting. I've had a number of teachers tell me that they feel like first year teachers again um, because of how new and different this world is. Has there really ever been a situation that has caused us to reflect on and see our practice from completely different points of view in such a way, and not only this, but it also highlights issues that have existed in our educational institutions for over hundreds of years. It's taking a highlighter over these issues and sort of forcing us to deal with them. The factory structure approach to learning, the schedule and wake up time for high school students, access to Wi-Fi and food and basic supports was an issue a year ago. The equity and social isolation of so many students was a big problem. We were experiencing an anxiety, depression uh, epidemic. We've had a lack of childcare, of healthcare, of, we've had issues with social division, et cetera. The gigantic head start students from higher economic class families get. All of these were issues before the pandemic and now we're being forced to deal with them. Some of the ones uh, I'm focused on these days are, for instance, student autonomy and agency individualized curriculum, which is easier in this remote format, actually. The crucial aspect of parental involvement, the schedule structure, and the quality versus quantity issue we have in education, all of these were issues before, and asynchronous learning provides a powerful platform 
to engage them with. Teaching summer school allowed me to perfect uh, to perfect the environment to respond to those reflections, to explore pedagogy in a way that was invigorating, new. And let me tell you, I've learned how to thrive in this learning environment, not just get by or meet some very low bar being set by so many others right now, be it students, be it parents, be it uh, administrators. If you haven't yet had the opportunity to hear this, let me say that this is a time to be creative to push our practice to a level unlikely to have happened in a conventional environment. Limitations can be freeing. Challenges and limitations often enhance our creative responses. So let's get creative and let's save education. Um, I had a parent over the summer make the statement to me uh, or ask the question, why is 80% of the work that my son is doing uh, the major aspect of his grade. Why is the, why is it homework? I, I kind of was like, uh, well, what isn't homework in a remote learning environment? When administrators were sharing their learning plans and then trying to explain them, I heard a lot of contrasting statements and confusion around the term asynchronous. This, in my opinion, has set teachers, students, and parents back a few weeks, maybe months, uh, on top of the other months that have been lost as they try to rebound from the reality of what so many are trying to force into an environment where those old ways, those old habits of teaching will not work. I've heard about and even been a part of many disagreements and even outright refusal about asynchronous and its benefits and I just don't think enough work has been done to define it for everyone and then share slash work through those benefits. Uh, the definition, simply put, asynchronous learning is defined as learning that does not occur in the same place or at the same time as everyone. Learning always happens for everyone in different times and in different ways. It's just that this is acknowledging the reality that has always existed and trying to use it to the benefit of remote learning. It uses resources that facilitate information sharing outside the constraints of time and place among a network of people and processes. Within remote learning research, it is conceived as the key feature of successful online learning programs. That's because it responds to the reality of a remote environment, pure and simple. We need to stop trying to force the square peg of traditional in-person learning into the round hole of remote learning. Here's some mindfulness. Live in the moment, be in the moment, and respond to the moment. Teachable moments, right? That's a term we always use. We need to acknowledge the environment that we have and utilize whatever's available and turn it into a benefit. Asynchronous learning allows students to access information, demonstrate what they've learned, and communicate with classmates and instructors on their own time. They don't have to be in the cl same classroom or even the same time zone to participate. It easily accommodates different learning styles as students can often choose their own adventure when it comes to the order they wish to cover material and how deep to dive into that any given topic. It allows parents to engage more freely and at times uh, that work best for them. It has freed up my schedule to do the same, given me choice over when I create my learning content and even given me more time for providing feedback. It, all, this, it allows really for true equity. Um, one student said to me, it's just like being in the classroom, except that I can pause it rewind it, rewatch, and engage at 10 p.m. when I'm feeling more awake. This is in reference to process videos that I have pre-recorded um, and allow students to watch when they want. I had another student complete, complete an entire two-week project in one day because she had some time, set up all her supplies, and fell into a flow state. She freed up her schedule to focus on other classes while probably being more mindful and present during the experience that I had cultivated for her. Focusing on one class for a longer duration allows for deeper learning, focus, and energy, which also enhanced her experiences in other classes because of the time that it opened up for her later in the week. 
I've done some heavy reflecting on early results students are, are producing this year, and I'm surprisingly ahead of where I'm normally at in the curriculum. And I'm seeing increased engagement among my students. Just yesterday, I had a student turn in all their missing projects, which uh, they were easily able to do because of asynchronous, because the videos I make are always available to watch at any time and in any, in really any order uh, and in a much better format than a Zoom meeting uh, would provide. So these video tutorials allow exactly what that student said. Uh, something education has been trying to figure out for hundreds of years, it allows students to learn at their own pace, to pursue it, uh, to pause it, to rewind it and watch again, watch it at 10 p.m. if that's when they are feeling more awake or in the case of the student who just turned in their work yesterday, watch it a month after they were supposed to and still get the same authentic experience they would have gotten if they did it when they were supposed to. Rather than redo the same process tutorial for each of my classes over and over again, I film it once in a more controlled environment in which each student has a front row seat, can pause when they miss something and not tune out because they got lost. And, and then I can use the same video endlessly in all of my classes. Um, we all know that when we do a tutorial that students are not paying attention uh, and forget what we just said two minutes after we said it. I mean, how many students uh, have you had uh, after you completed a tutorial that even the most basic element they're asking about two minutes later? Uh, how did you do that most basic thing? In the best of circumstances, we don't retain most information, let alone hear it. When a student is following along with my tutorials and they miss something, they just stop it. 100% of my students have thanked me for going this route. They enjoy videos much more than Zoom meetings and even uh, previous classroom lectures. They can learn at their own pace more authentically than ever. And so many districts are limiting that ability uh, by not embracing asynchronous. I have my videos on a YouTube channel, uh, Christopher, Christopher Sikora. You can also get them on my webpage, chrissikora.com. And some uh, are there for purchase as well. I break many of them into sessions and then I ask students to turn in work at checkpoints. Um, the two images on the right are actually students' work on my expressive abstract project for intro students after sessions two and then five. So that's the same student turning in their work at session two and then turning in again after they completed the assignment and just kind of showing the, the growth that happens while they're watching these videos. And again, because I pre-record these videos, I'm able to focus more of my time on individualized assessment and reflections of that student work. I also had a student say, like an art student tell me, I've always learned how to draw and how to do things with YouTube tutorials on my own time. And now it's like you're actually teaching in the way that I've been like trying to learn this whole time. Um, the other thing it has allowed me to do is, you know, benefit from my own time as well. Uh, my favorite benefit uh, is that I now have control over my own schedule. And one of my favorite things is having lunch with my, my children. Um, you know, creating a schedule that works for myself in this remote world is so important and asynchronous allows us to do that. The COVID reflections in asynchronous learning allow us to re- prioritize, and in some cases, focus more inward on our closest connections, our families. It slowed things down. Maybe it was time to slow down a bit. Yes, it has enhanced a lot of the limitations uh, in the world in a lot of areas as well. But as I mentioned, limitations can also be, uh, can enhance creative connections and outcomes. It has shifted our focus in what I think are maybe really important ways. I mean, what kind of world do we think our students uh, will inherit anyway? One that looks like it did 50 years ago? We are still teaching based on 100-year-old structures and goals. How many careers in the future will involve asynchronous experiences? What dispositions and skills are needed in that world? Shouldn't we use the moment, teach to the moment, and prepare our students for the world they will build? Asynchronous? 
and choice-based um, remote experiences, many elements of the gig economy, for better or for worse, will be a part of that world. And what, again, is fundamental to all of this is choice. Um, student agency is at the core of everything that we say is best for student learning allowing the, uh, students to make their own connections to define meaning for themselves by accessing you know their their own imaginations um, and exercising that I go deeper into those themes on my podcast and uh, TEDx talk how creativity will save education again you can check those out on my website but let me just summarize that agency leads to students differentiating for themselves which leads to, metacognition, learning how to learn, reflecting on learning. Self-assessment is fundamental to all of this. Uh, I was recently talking with a music teacher about the gap uh, of not being able to hear what students were playing. My response was, we need to get them to hear it for themselves. As a visual arts teacher, I need to get students to see it for themselves. This is metacognition. It's teaching students to fish rather than giving them the fish. How does one do that? Well, unfortunately, I'm not here to hold their hand anymore. And this is a huge challenge. Maybe that's a limitation we actually needed to have. For starters, students need to think more deeply about things that they choose, about the things that they are interested in. We know that that's what gets kids engaged and more focused. By simultaneously meeting the equity challenge, um, I have asked students to go outside and make some earth art like Andy Goldsworthy, to choose a project from a sketchbook choice board. And then I ask them to think about their thinking through more rigorous self-assessment processes that are also connected to socio-emotional intelligence and a growth mindset. Believe it or not, asynchronous learning provides more opportunities for assessment by focusing on the thinking about their thinking, slowing down a bit, I'm seeing greater gains in the long run and I'm seeing a lot more uh, reflection, which is where Zoom comes in, uh, Zoom meetings. I don't wanna go too far into this because this is not a presentation about synchronous learning, but I use Zooms exclusively for reflection, answering questions from the videos, critiquing artwork through discussions and simply building community. Um, I might respond to student questions by showing them uh, how to draw something during a Zoom or how to process something on a digital learning platform. But otherwise, I think it's a terrible platform for instruction. Really, it's not a great place to teach in general. Our remote learning structures should, should really reflect that. One student shared with me actually during a club meeting that she has to reteach herself the, most of the content at night after school because she just can't learn during Zooms. Most of the other students in that meeting agreed actually, uh, as well. So my new favorite tool um, in, in, in education is, uh, and something that I think is a far superior platform for what was traditional instruction is Edpuzzle. It's uh, my new favorite teaching tool. If you haven't yet, I suggest going and checking it out, uh, you know, telling your, your teacher friends, your teachers, other students about it. Basically, you can connect with YouTube videos, any YouTube video. Um, I make a lot of them on my own. And then add questions throughout the video that students need to answer in real time. So you can also use ed puzzles that other teachers have made. Um, I use some of my favorite YouTube videos. And I again, I, I make a lot of my own videos. Uh, sometimes I do like a process video. And then I upload that. Uh, add questions. And then I assign them asynchronously to my students to watch. Uh, when they want, by a certain due date, I have Edpuzzle Mondays, often kicking, kicking off a week with these, and then we reflect on them during Zoom meetings. Students have shared with me in surveys, because I try to survey them about their experiences as much as possible, that the Edpuzzles force them to pay attention and then rewind to check for answers when they have to answer the question they don't remember the answer. Because Edpuzzle also grades the student results in real time for me, um, it, it basically saves me a lot of time and it blends instruction and quizzes in a way that doesn't feel 
like either to students. They're watching a video, they're uh, accessing their their information in a way that that works better for them than a Zoom meeting. And then they're also getting constant questions that keep them engaged. Definitely check them out. I recommend keeping them to under 20 minutes uh, for sure, because that's when we start, everybody starts to kind of lose focus. Another huge benefit of asynchronous an element that's essential to remote learning success is the involvement of parents. Uh, in fact, in-depth research on remote learning suggests that parent involvement is part of a structured pyramid directly correlated to student achievement. I mean, parent involvement is always the number one factor in educational success, but it's enhanced even more now. Think about all those working parents struggling to manage their children's schedules with their work schedules, um, asynchronous learning allows them to structure their own schedules based on their unique needs. It calls parents in more effectively. Uh, I had a fellow teacher critique my take on asynchronous learning by suggesting it illustrated a laziness on the teacher's part, as if scheduling more Zooms is the only measure of, of teacher work levels. I said, on the contrary, my asynchronous videos uh, and more open schedule structure allows parents to view them more easily when their schedules better permit that. I've had tons of parents email me after watching some uh, and, and thank me, and they've watched my videos, my tutorial things, thanking me for A, freeing up their children's schedule uh, a bit, and then commenting on how they just enjoyed the video for themselves. Because here's the deal. Uh, students, especially high school students, were never meant to wake up at 6 a.m., then work through a factory-based schedule of 50 minutes in this class, now stop, five-minute passing period, 50 minutes in another class, now stop, five-minute passing period, rush to your other class, now you're in English, now you're in math, stop, repeat. When are students allowed to process the information they're, they're gaining, let alone the mental fatigue created by such a crazy pace structure? Another teacher used this anecdote that I like, that it's it's like working in Times Square with eight different bosses, and it's a race that you're supposed to finish at the exact same time. Asynchronous learning is finally an answer to that dysfunctional reality that we've created for students. And I had an AP student reflect, I can finally focus on what matters to me and then manage the things that I care far less about when it works best for me. All of that noise uh, that school adds to my learning is gone. So she's going into art school. She's heavily involved in the arts. She's now able to spend, you know, two hours set up and focus on her art and then maybe just do 20 minutes in math to get whatever she needs to get done to move on to the next process. And I think that that is the type of agency students should have should always have had. And make sure, though, as I have tried to communicate the structure clearly to parents and students. Um, I sent them my syllabus, which is on my website for download, which outlines my philosophy and process for engaging in the class. A major feature of my plan is that students can individually connect with me during asynchronous days. I have an open Zoom in which they join during regularly scheduled class times. I've had three students join at once, um, uh, sometimes more. Sometimes it's just one student. Um, and, and they're asking us, you know, maybe they're asking one question. Maybe it's a conversation. Uh, it's led to some more meaningful dialogue for me um, with students. Uh, and I form stronger relationships with them than if we were on, on Zoom, all in a Zoom together with like 30 students who don't have their, their cameras on. Students are coming to me uh, during my open classroom hours and on Zoom. Um, with their own questions, with their own engagement. And I again, it's a far better use of Zoom technology and I think everybody's time. Honestly, um, my schedule structure has never really been so schedule or structured. Um, I lay out an entire month in a calendar shared with students uh, with asynchronous, and synchronous days labeled clearly. This allows students to jump ahead if they want to and make decisions about their schedule. Then I send detailed instructions to students each day with my suggested process for completing the goals. Um, I ask students to check these updates every day. 
it's all it also lets parents see everything that their kids need to do as well as as like what I have prepared for them. And again, my teaching has never been so exposed. IEP case managers have mentioned that this is exactly what their kids have their students have needed all along flexibility and clearly defined structures. It's amazing that we can have both of those things when embracing something like asynchronous learning. Finally, and although um, I've shared this already, um, the socio-emotional and student agency uh, connections are so fundamental to authentic learning and developing metacognition. Maybe the best outcomes of asynchronous learning and something that's inherent in our content area is getting students away from their screens. Unless you're teaching a digital design class, uh, which is, makes it a lot harder, but then I really enjoy the challenge of finding ways to transform my projects to paper or physical experiences. Synchronous is synonymous with screen time, of course. And again, uh, to all digital teachers out there, I highly rec recommend finding ways to get students off of the screen sketchbooks, pencils, and markers might help. I had a teacher tell me that their kids had still not received the supplies that they had ordered for them. And we started brainstorming ways to deal with that. And I said, well, what if they just use things they found in nature? Draw with a stick, with a rock, uh, dirt, etc. Everyone has access to these nature-made materials. I asked students to go outside and collect materials, bring them back inside and make a found object sculpture as part of my creative materials challenge, uh, which I have the video on my website at chriscora.com. Again, limitations can often enhance our creative results. And this is an example. For the first time in my experience as a photo teacher, I can just tell students to go outside and take pictures. Um, rather than sit at a desk in front of a computer in a room where there's not a lot of interesting pictures to take. I think, honestly, photography was meant for asynchronous learning. Or, and this is truly wonderful, along with three other teachers and the goal of creating an exemplar unit for the Illinois School Board of Education, we created a choose your own adventure unit in which students investigate themselves through the cultural wheel or uh, identity wheel, it's referred to in different ways, developing a visual narrative in a sketchbook through a process that involves the five socio-emotional competencies, um, which you can find at castle.org, uh, their website, um, along with my own, connected that with my own six steps to the creative process and involves connections with other students along the way, culminating in a purely choice-based work of art. It's freedom scaffolded. And it can be done totally asynchronously. And the resource can be found on the IAEA website. Um, it's called Collaborating for Excellence. And really, again, uh, this whole the whole point of this, this presentation is to get people to embrace the power of asynchronous learning. Um, please connect with these resources. Uh, follow me on Instagram, go to my website. Um, and of course, check out my TED Talk, which goes into detail about these things, how creativity will save schools on YouTube. Thanks for watching. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at the moment.